this is my video about what I'm calling chapter 4 of The Lover Upon Trial. I was originally making this page 78 to 101. I've gone on to 109. That's a much better stopping point. This chapter opens with the passing of several days. Charles Mornington comes to visit the family every day and basically becomes one of the family. It doesn't seem to be helping his case. Early in this part we actually get something of a description of the two girls, Louisa and Lydia. For Louisa, it just says that she was black-eyed and brilliantly coloured. I don't know what that means. I'm actually thinking she might have dark hair as well, so that there's a contrast between her hair and her face and her lips might be redder. I'm not sure. I think the author is trying to make a case that that is classically beautiful, but it doesn't really mesh with portraits of the time and known beauties who were kind of golden haired, which is exactly what Lydia is. So I still don't really buy that Louisa is more attractive than Lydia. And I mean the very fact that Charles is interested in Lydia kind of suggests that Lydia is the more attractive one, because Louisa doesn't seem deficit in personality at all. I guess maybe she is a bit quieter, but no, that doesn't come across. The both girls seem to be laughing and talking and doing things together. We do get more of a description of Lydia at last. It says that Lydia has a symmetrical, graceful figure. She has delicate but not perfect features. Her light blue eyes were made expressive by uncommonly large and black pupils which some of the wise ones of the present day tell us always denote great imaginative powers. I don't know what to say about that. They had some interesting ideas at that time. Showers of sunny ringlets fell about her face in rich profusion. The author is trying very hard to impress on us how, how appealing Lydia is to Charles Mornington. And I think that's the idea of this. We are seeing Lydia through Charles's eyes. Charles is looking at her with his rose-coloured glasses. This is the sort of thing he's seeing. So purple as that prose might be, I think that's what she's going for. Charles isn't really being rational about this. We're also told that Lydia has feminine long fingers and she wears a whole lot of rings and Charles finds the rings quite dazzling. Those hands were so white and the nicely turned wrist so delicately veined. That is something that they often used to mention in this era, the veins. They liked veins. If you could see somebody's veins, that was attractive. That meant that they had transparent pale skin. But as the days have gone on, Charles has come to realise that she does have a brain and in fact the whole family is quite intellectual. They spend their evenings talking about books and analysing things. Even Sir William, who comes across as really prosy and slow, he actually does think a lot. He's apparently a, an excellent classical scholar. He speaks Latin and ancient Greek and he can tell you a whole lot about ancient philosophy and stuff. And Charles is starting to feel very inadequate. We learn that when Charles was at school, his education had not been attended to other than sending him to a public school from whence he was taken too soon after being considerably idle. And his father thought, this kid's going to be a rich man. He doesn't need an education. He may as well leave school. But now at the age of 29, that's something else we learn here, at the age of 29, Charles is suddenly wishing he'd done better at school because he's feeling very much, in his own words, the ignoramus. In this group. And there's this morning when he's in his own place in Highlands and he walks into his empty library and this is one of my favourite scenes in the whole book because this is something that I wish would happen to me. He is in his library but he doesn't have any books to put in here so it's just this room with all the empty shelves the bookcases were very handsome ones and capable of holding a vast quantity of books. His own stock was very small and looked most forlorn when he had arranged it on two or three solitary shelves. But as money was no object to him, and as books he was determined to have, he wrote at once to one of the first London booksellers to send him down an excellent collection of books, sufficient to fit up, as he termed it, 
a small gentleman's library. And in this order, he has asked for a few of the classics. And doesn't that sound like a fantastic thing to do? To just have this entire library and you've just got to go and get books to put in it. In due course, the books arrive, boxes and boxes and boxes of them. And it says that his valet is very surprised because the valet has lived with him for many years and has never seen his master with a book in his hand save the novel of the day or of late a few upon agriculture and trees. In the first page of every one the family crest with Charles Francis Mornington at full length beneath it. They're all in neat bindings, some of them in rich bindings. It says in a very short time so impatient was the lover they were unpacked. Steps and ladders were quickly brought and by sunset the library was perfectly filled and properly arranged. But alas, all looked so betrayingly new. It was easy to see at a glance that none of the works had ever been studied, except those very few which had been Mornington's when he used. At the time when a certain degree of study was forced upon him and into him, and that small collection had been so ill-used and so thrown about that now he was obliged to put them quite out of sight. So painfully did their outward garb contrast with the fresh and elegant bindings of the newcomers. So Charles decides that he's going to make this library his morning room and every morning he is going to come in here and spend a few hours with his books and become an educated man for Lydia. And we're told it had two most comfortable armchairs with a handsome and commodious table in the centre. So the very morning after this new arrangement, as soon as breakfast was over, he took down a beautiful looking Virgil, placed it in a convenient reading desk, took a special care to have a capital dictionary by his side, and then began to read, or we should say attempted to read. But alas, it was a most difficult and almost hopeless business. Here and there he made out a line or two, but take it all in all, he might nearly as well have tried to puzzle out the Eskimo language or any other one that he had never before beheld as attempt to understand Virgil. I think it's interesting that they mentioned the Eskimo language there and I stumbled over that word. I did not recognise it for a minute because of its very odd spelling. You know, I have a Virgil, and I quite understand why he had trouble. Years ago, I studied a bit of Latin. I really should pick it up again. I'd love to be able to speak Latin and read some of the Latin in my books. But it's a very hard language to read if you don't have any other resources. And it's been years since he studied it at school, and obviously it was of no interest whatsoever to him then. So he just didn't get anywhere. But he made a good try. He tried a couple of books and then he gave up on the Latin and he actually found the very book that Lydia had been talking about that she'd read with Mrs Leonard where she found clouds, including cumulus clouds, and he took that down thinking maybe if he got really good at that he could have a talk to Lydia about it, but no, that one was just as hard for him. And after that, he was so depressed that the next day he didn't even go to the Grange. He just thought it was over. He couldn't do it. Something else I'll say here, it says in the first page of every book was the family crest with Charles Francis Mornington at full length beneath it. I have a lot of old books that contain that sort of thing and I brought one out. This one's a bit older. This is Rapine's History of England or one volume in Rapine's History of England. This one's actually a 1727 volume and it's not quite the same because what we've got in the beginning of this is an award. It was obviously an examination prize, but it's the same sort of thing. We've got the crest and we've got the name of the person that was Kildare Burroughs, who was, you know, I cannot remember offhand who he was. That's all I wanted to say was that that's the sort of thing that he had in the beginning his crest and his name. 1739, this one was war awarded, printed in 1726 in Dublin. After he got over his massive depression, he did go back to the Grange. On the day he went back, Lady Middlemore and Sir William are not there for some reason. Doesn't say where they are, just that they're not there. The footman showed him into the drawing room and left him there. And after a while he realized nobody was coming. So 
since the drawing room has French doors that open out onto the lawn, he just wandered out. Wandered along the front of the house and heard Louisa's voice and Lydia's laugh and followed it and came to the schoolroom, which is on the ground floor, which makes me wonder exactly where they were at the start of the story because they were upstairs because Lydia went down maybe they've got two schoolrooms anyway the younger children are out playing on the lawns and it's only Louisa and Lydia who are in the schoolroom because this is how lessons go in the Grange household and Lydia is not really pleased to see Charles Mornington but there's quite a funny scene Louisa was reading aloud and she's interrupted when Charles comes in Lydia was sitting at a table copying a drawing. It's a drawing of the gardens. And there's a copy of the drawing that she is doing at the moment. And the original is fairly well done and the copy is a bit amateur. And Charles comes in, looks over her shoulder at what she's doing and he compliments it. How wonderful this drawing is and how it's so much better than the original and so much more masterful. Then he realised that Lydia is shaking and she's shaking with laughter because the original drawing that he said wasn't as good was actually hers and the drawing that she was working on at the moment was Flora's copy and she was just touching it up a bit for Flora. So Charles has come in and said this to flatter her but he actually accidentally criticised her work and complimented Flora's which Lydia just finds so funny. When Charles realises that happened because Louisa explains it he is utterly mortified for a second but he comes clean and he says okay you got me I was just trying to flatter you I thought you'd be happy to hear this and Lydia is actually quite impressed that he owned up to that and she thinks it was very nicely done the way he just came clean. Because of that he asks if he can have the original drawing which was hers and she says yep yeah, go into the alcove there and grab a piece of paper for us to roll it in. So he nips into the alcove and at that second somebody comes into the room and it's cousin Frederick who I mentioned a long time ago. Cousin Frederick has just arrived from university he's on break it turns out he's 20 so he's actually the same age as Lydia I mean she's about to be she's going to be 20 in I think a month now and he's just turned 20 so they're very close to the same age Frederick is much like Lydia he's got a quick mind he's intelligent he's very personable and we now learn that Frederick is also in love with Lydia when he first comes in he doesn't see Charles there's a bit of very amicable chat between Lydia and Frederick which Charles gets to see from over at the alcove he's a bit worried about this because he can see that the two of them get on with the greatest of ease and then he steps out of the alcove and Frederick is really disturbed to see him there this strange person running loose and disturbed to see that Lydia has given him a drawing and rather quickly comes to realise that Charles is a competitor for Lydia. You see we've now got two men who are interested in Lydia and nobody interested in Louisa so once again I'm not saying that Louisa is the most attractive one whether she's the acknowledged beauty or not. Beauty and attraction are different maybe maybe that's the issue but I don't think so because here's Lydia with her golden ringlets and her blue eyes and her long thin fingers and her veined wrists. Fred is a total grump from this moment on. He doesn't appear to advantage at all once he realises that Charles has basically got free reign of the house and is constantly with them. It transpires that Frederick is there because well it's a bit hazy on this it looks like it was total coincidence Frederick stopped by on his way home from university he's on university holidays and his mother writes to Lady Middlemore to say that one of the younger children have Scarlatina and can Frederick stay at the Grange for his holidays so he's going to be there for a couple of weeks and I actually think it would have been stronger if he just rocked up with that purpose not because he wanted to see Lydia on his way home and then coincidentally is forced to stay but that aside Fred's arrival makes for a bit of drama that wasn't there before there's this time when Lydia is walking behind a hedge and on the other side of the hedge is Charles and Fred 
Fred must have seen Charles and he's come up to talk to him and neither of them know that Lydia's there. She didn't know they were there until she heard their voices. She's not intentionally eavesdropping. Uh, Fred's got his back up and he says to Charles, do you really think there's any point you being here? Lydia isn't interested in you. You may as well go away. Charles says, well, if she's actually not interested in me, I will go away. But why do you say that? Why do you think that? And Fred can't really answer. And that makes him even more annoyed. And he tries to call Charles out in a duel. And Charles shuts him down and says, no, I'm not doing that. You don't know it, but I'm actually one of the best shots in the county. And you don't need to call me out. If Lydia says no, I'll just go away and she'll never be bothered by me again, but I hope she won't. And Lydia is really impressed by the way he does this. It's a very calm and mature way that he diffuses the whole situation and, and refuses to take the bait, and he shows himself to be a level-headed person. And then later on, Fred continues to be in this vile mood, and Charles just shows himself to be better and better. And they hatch this plan to go back to the town, and it's now the town of El. They're going to go to L with a long dash, but it's the same place because the plan is to go to the Dolphin, which was the pub that they went to where they had a meal before. But now it's L, so I think the author might have just changed her mind about that. Fred says, no, I'm not going because he's still in the grumps. All the effort I went to trying to figure out what the place was, maybe was for nothing. Anyway, they're going to go to a cathedral, the Cathedral of L with a long dash. And it turns out that... Charles knows a lot about cathedrals. When he was a kid, in school holidays, he stayed with his great aunt, who was an old lady with poor mobility. She happened to live next door to a cathedral, and in his holidays, he used to wander the cathedral grounds. He would watch the workmen, look at the building. After a while, the workmen got to know him, and they would tell him about the place. He learned about the architecture, how it was built and what it was all for. Then someone gave him some books about it and it says that if Charles is interested in something he learns it very thoroughly. So he is actually very knowledgeable about cathedrals and Lydia is quite impressed with his knowledge. He can talk about the types of beams and the types of windows and the types of gables and all sorts of stuff like that. The architecture he knows quite well. So they have this plan hatched that the next day they're going to go to the cathedral. The next day comes, Charles arrives in a different vehicle. He's got um, something called a britchka, which is kind of like a family vehicle. And it seems like they're all going. It's got an enclosed bit at the back. It's a long vehicle and they can all travel in it, it seems, maybe. I'm a bit hazy on this. But they certainly travel back in it, so I'm guessing they've all travelled there in it too. Lydia sits outside on the seat with Charles, and Charles is driving. And they do talk on the way in. They stop at Mrs Leonard's, and they pick her up and take her with them. It says that she was very interested to see Charles and to learn more about him. As they go around the cathedral, Mrs Leonard and Charles act like tour guides and tell them everything as they go. And it turns out that Charles actually knows even more than Mrs Leonard. And Lydia is really impressed by this. Charles gets to support her as they're walking up the narrow stairs and down into the cells. He's having a great day. This has been a really good time for him. While they're at the cathedral, Lydia slips away, as she tends to do. They were looking at the main building and divine service started and they decided they'd slip away. So they've slipped away and she's managed to slip away in a different way to the others because she wanted a bit of time on her own. And she slips out to what they call a side aisle where there is a monument for her family, where all her family are buried, the Middlemore Vault. The whole book, in the flick of a switch, the whole book changes mood, because the most recent death in the family vault turns out to be Lydia's twin sister, who died four years ago at the age of 15. I feel like this is information we should have been given much earlier in the story. Here we are with Lydia who is just happy and cheerful and never serious really. I mean she's serious in that she's intellectual but she just seems to be so irresponsible. But suddenly she's looking at her sister's name. Her sister's name was Clarissa and she's looking at the writing and she's remembering Clarissa and she's remembering as if it just happened. She's remembering the sickness that took her sister away and how how Clarissa faded before her eyes and she remembers Clarissa's last moment of life when she turned her eyes up to the ceiling and, and 
life faded from them and she remembers kissing her sister's cold cheek before they put her in the coffin and then she remembers the coffin being lowered into the ground and how terrible that yawning chasm is that's how they describe it when it's about to take possession of somebody you care about and it's really well written the whole thing is written with so much feeling and it's a very, very hard moment for Lydia. She's thrown right back into it. And then she's thinking, I can't possibly marry somebody who couldn't support me through this. I've lost somebody so important and my family means so much to me. And I can only abide going on if I have support. And Charles Mornington can't give that to me. And so she has this moment of blinding clarity where she realizes that's what she needs in a husband. And there is absolutely no way that Charles can do that. Then there's this other moment where the church choir has started singing and she can't quite hear the song, but it sounds really ethereal and it sounds like the voice of God coming directly to her. And at that same moment, there's a beam of light, the clouds clear outside and a beam of light comes down and lands directly on the family monument. And she's looking at her sister's name that's now sort of the lettering glowing in the beam of light. It's like a true religious revelation and it takes everything out of her. So she's there for several more minutes in a sort of a daze where it's all become clear what she needs and what's going on in her world and how unhealed she still is. After this, she pulls herself back together and returns to the family group. But, you know, she's sort of lost all her life. But for a few moments there, she's thinking, it's too hard to just carry on. I want to go and join Clarissa now and not worry about all the rest. Anyway, when she rejoins the family, her mother sees instantly that she's very, very fagged and pale and she's just lost all her energy. So when they go back, her mother insists that Lydia ride back inside with Lady Middlemore and with Louisa and Fanny goes out on the seat with Charles Mornington. But after that, it's all switched back. So Charles had this 24 hours where he was doing everything right and he was just starting to seem a bit more compatible, although Lydia never, ever, ever even thought of him in that way. It was just he he seemed less gorge to her. But it's all over now. When they get back, Fred has recovered his good spirits. He's had time to think things through. He realises that he was a total idiot. He apologises to Charles and oh it's pretty hard to make up for it and he sees how Lydia is and that has that cheers him up no end because he realizes there's no way that she would come back looking so sad and depressed if it had gone well with Charles and he notices that she's inside not out on the seat so he's thinking right Charles doesn't have a chance that's true and so as the meal goes on because Charles is staying for the meal Charles has also noticed that she's really depressed but he tries to sort of push her out of it he keeps trying to say things to her and saying you know she's you seem really tired why don't you have some food that's what you need it's been so long since you ate and that's not the courteous thing to do that's not etiquette it's also just not very nice so Fred is jumping in and when Charles starts doing this, Fred is sort of steering the conversation away, kind of protecting Lydia from the attention and Lydia does notice this. So by the end of the evening, Lydia is extremely grateful to her cousin Fred and Charles has lost every bit of ground that he had started to gain. But the book says he doesn't realise that. So that's where I've ended it. The meal is over, the evening is done. From here we go into the days following this event. But I feel like there was so much that happened. This chapter turned the story. You see everybody in a different light. Lydia has made what looks like a big leap in maturity. I'm not sure it is. I think she's just been forced to face something that up until now she'd managed to deny. So she's sort of having a, it's, it's a wake up call. For Lydia but it makes her a much more sympathetic character I think. There was something else in here that I noticed. The author spent a couple of pages talking about this meal and how Charles Mornington was kind of nagging Lydia just a little bit to sort of nudge her out of her 
out of the doldrums, as it were, without realising that her issues were more serious, that her, her mood was a more serious problem than just tiredness. And how Lydia is sort of turning against him because his inability to sympathise, to understand where she's at, is actually just making everything much worse for her. And the author says, here's another overwritten statement here, but alas, what trifles light as air affect too often our likings and dislikings. How frequently does a mere nothing, as it were, make an impression upon our two easily biased minds? And that's about Charles sort of nagging at her and how that is a trifle and shouldn't have affected her. But I just like to say that that's kind of missing the point in a way. The author has, I'd say she's felt this herself. She has written this so beautifully. She's certainly observed it and empathised if she hasn't actually felt it herself but she hasn't quite identified that this looks like a little thing but this is not this is a very fundamental matter of Lydia needs sympathy and support and love and understanding from those around her and that hasn't even occurred to him he is so on a different plane in his thoughts and maybe that makes sense because he's not one of the family he doesn't know her past he does not know that she had a twin sister who died. He does not know any of this. He does not know that they just visited the place where that sister is buried. So it's perfectly understandable that he would act the way he is because he has no idea that there is anything of greater portent behind her moods than just tiredness and not eating properly. This is not a little thing. The little thing in part is that he doesn't have the information that really he should. The family, I think, should be helping him along more here. But even so, Fred was very quick to see that Lydia is actually very sad, that this is sadness. This isn't tiredness. She is sad. Charles's inability to read Lydia is not a small thing. I feel like we had no preparation for this in the whole book, but it was an extremely well-written couple of pages. You absolutely felt with her. There was nothing purple about the prose in that section. It was every word needed to be here. Every word had its place. I would almost say that those couple of pages were written from the heart and the author didn't really feel any need to edit them. And so, since there's no more to say about that, I'll leave it there. The next section is going to be the last one. That's going to go from page 109 up to page 157. That sounds like a lot, but the story is starting to race along now and it's not really as convoluted as it was at the start. So I think, I think that's a manageable chunk. And so I'll leave it there. Thank you for watching.